to introduction. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, the problem of proving so-called basis collapse theorems for holographic algorithms over all domain sizes. Um, so I guess I'll start off with uh, sort of a brief introduction to material that I'm guessing a lot of people in the audience will be familiar with, um, but just an intro to match gates and holographic algorithms. Um, all right, so again, um, we'll be working with the theory of match gates in which we sort of want to reduce uh, given counting problems to the problem of counting perfect matchings in uh, planar graphs. Um, so the problem of counting perfect matchings in arbitrary graphs, uh, we know to be sharp p-complete. But when we restrict our graphs to be planar, uh, then the problem is easy. Um, and roughly speaking, the reason is that this perfect matching polynomial um, ends up being basically the same as the, the Fafian polynomial um, for a corresponding graphs adjacency matrix. Um, and we sort of, the only discrepancy is we have this sort of sign that is associated to each perfect matching. Um, but it turns out that for planar graphs, we can sort of orient the edges in such a way that these signs sort of uh, go away, and the Fafian ends up agreeing with the perfect match polynomial. And then the fact that the Fafian is merely uh, the square root of the determinant of the adjacency matrix is enough for us to sort of compute the number of perfect matchings in polynomial time. Um, all right, so now let's just take a sample counting problem. Uh, say we have some uh, Boolean formula, and we want to count the number of satisfying assignments. Um, and for our purposes, let's just imagine that this formula happens to be planar. Um, so if we draw the corresponding bipartite graph, where on the left-hand side we have the variables, and on the right-hand side we have the clauses, um, and we draw the corresponding edges, uh, let's just assume for now that this, uh, for inspective purposes, this graph is planar. Um, and furthermore, let's just, you know, re let's restrict our attention to the case where every variable appears at most twice um, in the formula, and each clause, you know, uh, accepts the variables. All right, so uh, let's sort of imagine that um, each satisfying assignment sort of corresponds to sort of sending a yes or no signal along each of these sort of intermediate wires. Um, and so I guess I'll denote these by green if the variable, the corresponding variable is assigned true and black if it's not. Um, and we sort of have two constraints on the assignments to these wires um, that sort of yield a satisfying assignment to this formula. Um, the first is that every time a variable appears, um, the signal that it sort of sends has to be consistent. Um, in other words, uh, the out of any given vertex on the left, um, the two signals it sends must either both be green or both be black. And we sort of note this with this uh, sort of signature vector. Um, likewise, you know, we want this to be a satisfying assignment, so every clause has to have at least one true. Um, and again, we sort of denote this with this signature. Um, so if there's at least one one among the, if there's at least one true signal among the three incoming signals, then we sort of say we like it. All right. Um, and the idea to reduce to the problem of perfect matchings in planar graphs is to sort of encode these signatures using the matching properties of graphs. Um, right, so a match gate is basically just a weighted graph with some special subset of vertices called external nodes. Um, and we'll say that the number of those external nodes is the so-called arity of this match gate. Um, and the standard signature of this match gate is going to be um, basically the vector which consists, well, let's say, indexed by subsets of those external nodes. And so for each subset, we look at the number of perfect matchings of the subgraph we get after we remove that subset. Um, right, and so this is called the standard signature. Uh, so as an example, you know, this is pretty elementary, but okay, so if these are the two external nodes of this match gate, then we get the following standard signature. Um, likewise, you can check that this is also true. Right. Um, and the idea is, if we can find standard uh, match gates, planar match gates, which have these standard signatures corresponding to the consistency and satisfaction constraints, then basically all we want to do is you know, replace every one of these vertices on the left with uh, a match gate whose standard signature um, is, uh, you know, encodes the, uh, the consistency constraint, and everything on the right we replace with a match gate which has standard signature encoding the satisfaction constraint. And if we can do this, then we sort of, okay, now let's look at all possible, you know, uh, assignments to these wires. Um, this is one such. Um, and uh, we look at how many, you know, perfect matchings of this new bigger graph we obtain when these wires in green are present in the graph. Well, if these wires are in green are present in the graph, then their endpoints um, 
uh, can't be or sort of omitted from the corresponding match gates. And so if we want to count the number of perfect matchings of this, this new match grid, we look at the corresponding entries um, in the standard signatures of the generators um, when the uh, endpoints are removed from those generators, and likewise uh, when the endpoints are removed from the recognizers. And we sort of multiply all of these entries together, and we get the number of perfect, we get the number of perfect matchings um, in which these green edges are present. And the point is that in this way, we sort of establish a bijection between the number of perfect matchings of this new bigger graph and the number of um, sort of satisfying assignments to our original problem. Um, but the bad news is that uh, the satisfaction uh, vector um, sort of has no uh, match, planar match gate that has uh, the corresponding standard signature. Um, and again, the reason is this sort of parity thing where um, you know, a graph with an odd number of indices has no perfect matching. So uh, for a given standard signature, only the indices um, of one particular parity um, will have entries that are not zero. And sort of the saving grace, so this is all sort of the pre-holographic stuff. Um, so the actual do-nothing part is where um, we apply the so-called basis change. Right? So let's think of this perfect matching sort of as an inner product of vectors in the following way. Um, so we're going to sum over all possible 2 to the w assignments to the wires. Um, and then we'll look at the corresponding uh, indices that are, the corresponding vertices in the generators and the recognizers that are removed. Um, and as, as I said before, what we're going to do is we're going to take the corresponding entries in the standard signatures and sort of multiply them together for any given assignment to the wires. And we take the sum of products, and this is essentially just the inner product of the following two um, tensor products. Uh, so this G is just going to be a particular tensor product of all of the standard signatures of the generators. Um, and this R is going to be the tensor product of the standard signatures of the recognizers, uh, where the order is specified sort of by the configuration of the wires. Um, and you can also think of this inner product sort of as uh, sort of a dual vector being applied to a primal vector um, in the following way. Uh, we can regard this, uh, this tensor product of all the standard signatures of the generators as an element in C to the 2 to the W, and we'll regard the recognizer tensor as an element in the dual space. Um, and now this perfect matching polynomial, this inner product is just you apply the dual vector R to the primal vector G. Um, and the point of holographic algorithms is that this is independent of the choice of basis um, for X. So in particular, um, now let's sort of apply a change of basis. Um, so given the 2 by 2 basis matrix, uh, define the signature with respect to that basis matrix uh, for a generator um, to be the vector G. Uh, which satisfies this equation. So in some sense, it's the coefficients um, under this new basis. Um, and likewise, for the recognizer, uh, apply sort of the dual basis change, and we'll say the signature with respect to this basis for a recognizer um, is going to be the vector r satisfying this. And the point is that now if we find uh, match gates which have uh, sort of these signatures, um, then we're sort of still home free, and we can still compute the number of satisfying assignments in polynomial time. Um, and so this can't be done over the complex numbers, and it can't be done over the Boolean domain. But over you know, mod 7, um, famously, we have sort of uh, an explicit example of a basis and corresponding standard signatures. Um, so that over this basis, the corresponding signatures are precisely the uh, consistency and satisfaction um, constraint. So in other words, counting planar, read twice, monotone 3 CNFs, mod 7 is easy. Right. So, uh, and the particular match gates that have those standard signatures are the ones I sort of gave earlier. Right. So this is, that was a very brief introduction to uh, match gates and holographic algorithms. Um, so now let me get on to the focus of this talk, which is on sort of the two main parameters that we sort of deal with in holographic algorithms. One is the so-called basis size, and one is the so-called domain size. Right, so the domain size um, is essentially the range of values that our you know, given counting problem um, can take on. Um, so if we're working over domain size 2, which we have been so far, this deals with problems like counting Boolean satisfying assignments, vertex covers, perfect matchings, uh, ice problems. Um, but more generally, over domain size k, uh, we can ask, you know, let's count the number of you know, 
k colorings of a graph are subject to certain constraints. Right? So domain size is just the number of colors you have. Um, right, so what changes over domain size, domain size k is that now our signatures with respect to um, a given matrix are now vectors that mention k to the n. Uh, the point is that all of the uh, incoming edges to a vertex um, can now take on not just two values, but k values. And so we sort of have k to the n possible combinations, very n incoming edges. Um, and now, by this, you know, these definitions of signatures with respect to a given matrix, uh, given basis, we see that this, uh, just by comparing you know, the dimensions of the matrices, we see that the basis matrix now has to have width k. Um, so how do we handle this uh, introduction of k colors instead of just two colors? Um, so in the main size k equals 2 case, uh, we sort of encoded each color, each of the two colors, sort of by the presence or the absence of an external node. So when this wire is green, when you know, the corresponding uh, uh, value in our uh, Boolean formula for a variable is set to be true, then we sort of say, OK, this, uh, this vertex we remove. If it's uh, set to be false, then we sort of include this vertex. All right, so that was sort of how we encoded colors uh, in the domain size 2 case. And more generally, um, if we have some wider range of colors, what we're going to do is instead of encoding by the presence or absence of you know, one external node, we're going to do the presence or absence of some subset of L external nodes. Um, and in other words, now when we work with, uh, now we're going to work with sort of uh, uh, blocks of L nodes. Um, and so the number of external nodes for a given match case is going to be some multiple of this parameter L. Right. And uh, intuitively, you should think of L as kind of like the number of bits you need to encode of the k colors. Um, and so what changes now? Well, as I said, the arities of these match gates are now going to be multiples of L. Um, the external nodes are going to be grouped into blocks of L, where the wires between match gates are connected blockwise. Um, and because... Uh, you know, we want to still satisfy these relations, we see that now this basis matrix has to be of height 2 to the L. Um, and so to summarize, you need bases of uh, dimensions 2 to the L by K, um, and we're going to call this L the basis size. So um, the sort of basic question that uh, we want to address is, for a given domain, si given domain size of problems, what is the smallest basis size you need in order to sort of solve all possible problems, uh, simulate all possible holographic algorithms over that domain size. Um, all right, so that's the subject of this talk. Um, and to, to start off, we're going to first uh, make some you know, uh, preliminary. Uh, um, so here's some preliminary setup. We're going to regard these standard signatures no longer as vectors, but as matrices, where the TF matrix form uh, of a standard signature um, basically, you're going to take all of the external nodes in block T, um, and you look at all possible two to the L combinations, uh, two to the L subsets of those uh, external ver external nodes, um, and those are going to be the sort of rows of our matrix, and the columns are going to be sort of the possible subsets of the remaining external nodes. Um, so we're basically just re-indexing re 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 our standard signature vector into this matrix form. And we do the same thing for you know, these signature vectors um, with respect to a given basis. Um, so instead of a k to the n vector, it's going to be a k by k to the n minus 1 matrix. Um, and throughout, I'll denote row indices by superscripts and column indices by subscripts. Um, and so the technical assumption that we'll make uh, in this work is that um, uh, so we have this uh, term called full rank. Um, so we say that a generator is a full rank if there exists some uh, block T for which the rank of that uh, TF matrix form of G is going to be K if it's uh, full rank. Um, and so the reason we make this assumption, um, well, in the case of uh, domain size 2, um, if our holographic algorithm doesn't use any full rank uh, signatures, then uh, it turns out that you know, this holographic algorithm, in some sense, is trivial. Um, this is not necessarily true in the case of domain size k, but this is sort of a technical assumption that we'll be making throughout. Um, and we can check that, well, it turns out that we can assume also that this basis matrix is also a full rank, um, and that this identity holds. Um, so in particular, we're going to be working in the setting where the, um, the standard signature matrix, oops, 
the standard signature matrix is always going to be of rank k for some block t. And so the question we'll deal with is, given, do, given a domain size k, what is the smallest basis size l for which any holographic algorithm over this domain size, which has a full rank match gate, can be simulated by one over basis size l? Okay. So um, back in 08, uh, a long time ago, uh, over domain size 2, um, we, uh, so Tsai, uh, Tsai and Liu showed that uh, we actually only need a basis size of 1. In other words, all we need to do to consider uh, you know, holographic algorithms of the Boolean domain is to look at uh, basis matrices uh, that are 2 by 2 matrices. Um, and this led to a, a beautiful line of work sort of classifying the structural theory of you know, holographic algorithms over domain size 2. Um, and more recently, um, it was shown that over domain sizes 3 and 4, you correspondingly need basis size 1 or 2. So in other words, over domain size 3, you need a 2 by 3 basis matrix. Over domain size 4, you need sort of a 4 by 4. And more generally, um, there is a conjecture that over domain size k, you need floor function of log base 2 of k. Um, and so the intuition for this log 2 of k, again, is that this basis size you sort of think of as the number of bits you need to encode your k colors. Um, but the real surprise is that you know, uh, this floor function appears. So you don't actually need all log to the 2k bits in order to actually um, encode all these colors. Um, and so uh, in independent works, um, uh, Mingji and I um, showed that this conjecture is actually true. Um, and so uh, in this talk, I'll focus on uh, my approach, which is um, through sort of uh, more algebraic techniques. Um, and so let me just first give a sketch of the argument. Um, right, so uh, first, some technical definition. Let's say some subset of you know, the n length n bit strings um, is called the cluster. If we can sort of think of it as um, some collection of the uh, bits are fixed, and the rest are allowed to sort of vary. Um, so we sort of write the set of uh, indices that are allowed to vary. Um, uh, let's say there are some positions p1 through pm. And we sort of write this cluster as some fixed string plus these uh, strings ep1 to epm, where ei sort of denotes the bit string, which is all zeros, except at the i position in which it's a 1. Right. So for example, uh, this cluster 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 is a cluster which we can write as 0, 0, 0 plus, you know, we we'll, we'll allow positions 1 and 3 to vary. Right. Sorry, can you explain that again? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we sort of think of a cluster, all right, so I guess I'll just try to go through this example. So in this case, um, we see that in all four strings, the the position that sort of stays the same is the second position in which we have all zeros. But the other two positions uh, sort of range over all possible bit strings of length 2. Right? Um, so this is a cluster that we denote as follows. You're allowed to add 0, 0, 0 plus 0, 0, 0. You don't have to add E1 or E3. Um, oh, yeah, so uh, I, I guess this is just notation. So the E1, E3, it's just saying that. You have the option to have them. Yes, exactly. But you're not required to have yes. something. Yes. So you take some subset of the positions, right. and then, yeah. I got it. Yep, yep. Cool. Um, all right, so the, the rough outline, we have sort of three steps. Uh, the main ingredient is you want to show that any standard signature of rank at least 2 to the k. So. Um, to start with, let's, let's assume for now that we're in the setting where the domain size is a power of 2, and I'll say later why uh, this can generalize to all domain sizes. Um, and so what we want to show is that any standard signature of rank at least this domain size contains a cluster of linearly independent rows, um, 2 to the k linearly independent rows. Right? So this is one ingredient. The next is basically that you know, inverting standard signatures, in some sense, also gives us standard signatures. Uh, inverting in the sense of uh, matrix multiplication. And lastly, I'll show how these two ingredients uh, sort of allow us to simulate using a smaller basis size. Right. So in some sense, step one is kind of the technical core of this proof. Um, step two is adapted from uh, a previous result um, in sort of an alternative formulation of match gates called character theory. Um, and this simulation step is due to uh, Tai and Fu um, 
in their proof for the collapse theorem over domain sizes three and four. Okay. So two and three are sort of uh, essentially they've already been done. Um, so I'll sort of try to speed through these. Um, all right, so the, the group property. Um, basically, I want to say that full rank twos of k by twos of the n minus one k standard signatures have right inverses under matrix multiplication, um, which are also standard signatures. All right, so I can somehow somehow the standard signatures kind of form a group under multiplication, um, and the proof that Li and Sha had is uh, essentially as follows. Um, so given some some match gate, we want to kind of invert it. Uh, so we're going to sort of attach match gates on the left and right, which reduce its standard signature to one that's effectively a smaller match gate disjoint union with this separate edge. And how do we invert this new match gate? Well, basically we know inductively that this smaller match gate has some inverse. And now we just append you know, the separate disjoint edge from it. Um, and if we connect these, which corresponds to matrix multiplication, then we get the identity. Right. So, in some, so in some sense, to get this group property, all we're doing is induction with some clever row and column operations. Right. So that's the group property. Um, and so how do you use sort of cluster existence and group property to get the collapse result? Um, so by cluster existence, uh, okay, let's first pick out a generator with a full rank signature. Um, and let's find a cluster of, of row indices. Um, let's call it Z. And now let's index into the rows of our basis matrix via this Z to obtain a smaller basis matrix. And I claim that I can use the smaller basis matrix, which is of the desired basis size of log base 2 of K, um, for the simulation. And so for each uh, generator, I'm going to sort of construct these new uh, generators as follows. I'm going to take this Z and index into each of the blocks via that z. And I'm only going to keep as external nodes those nodes which are indexed by z. All right, so the red ones are correspond to this cluster z. And I'm just going to keep those as external nodes. And the rest I'll sort of regard as internal to the, to the match gate. All right, and I denote this by uh, g star z. Um, and similarly, I'm going to take this g uh, complement t z uh, to be the match gate where in all but block T, I'm still going to keep only those uh, external nodes indexed by Z as external nodes. Um, but in block T, I'm going to keep everything as an external node. All right, so these are just some, uh, some new match gates that I create out of all the existing generators. Um, and it turns out that these generators, with respect to the smaller matrix, uh, basis matrix M superscript Z, have the they sort of preserve the original signatures that our generators had. Right. Um, and now we want to say, you know, in some sense, to achieve recognizers which have the same original recognizer signatures, I want to somehow say I can divide this m to the z out of my original matrix m. So the question is, is this new thing a valid standard signature of a recognizer? Um, well, this is where the group property comes in. Um, let's define this new thing, t, which is m divided by mz. And by construction, this, uh, so, uh, this generator here um, sort of satisfies the following identity. Uh, this t sort of allows us to transform between the two match gates that I showed earlier. Um, and now if I take this t and I move it to the other side, um, then I actually conclude that um, the recognizers I need are uh, precisely, I take the original match gate uh, and I attach sort of this transducer T. Um, and the point is that the original signatures that we had are sort of preserved. So this is sort of a very fast account of this kind of approach. But suffice to say that cluster existence and group, and group property are enough to give us the collapse theorem. And so. Um, now, I guess in the remaining time, I'll try to sketch the, the proof of cluster existence, which is sort of like the main contribution of this work. Um, and so the, the key ingredient is this thing I call rank rigidity. Right. And so the, the surprising thing that sort of lies at the heart of this floor function log base 2 of k is this fact that uh, if you take any standard signature in matrix form, the rank is always a power of 2. 
Um, and so intuitively, why does that give us the score function? It sort of says, okay, if we're working over domain size, let's say, 10, uh, we actually get collapse as good as uh, over domain size 8. So instead of just collapsing to log base 2 of 10, we collapse to 3, which is floor function of log base 2 of 10. All right, so this rank rigidity is sort of the main ingredient. And how do we prove this? Um, we're going to use an algebraic technique based on sort of the so-called match get identities. Right? So it turns out there's a necessary and sufficient characterization of the standard signatures of match gates. Um, so we have this hideous looking uh, sort of set of po uh, quadratic polynomial equations um, that the entries of standard signatures uh, satisfy. Um, no need to look further into you know, what, what this is. Uh, let me just extract out sort of the most useful facts about these identities. Um, so first of all, let me, so let me draw your attention to the plus or minus that's in these identities. Uh, it turns out that um, this plus or minus will depend sort of on the value of t and sort of uh, for, for now, let's just uh, abstract that out and just say, you know, a matrix is a pseudo signature if these identities hold up to a sign of plus or minus. So this is just some technical thing. We're just kind of being lazy and we want to ignore this. Um, and so pseudo, pseudo signatures can include, you know, ordinary standard signatures, and they also can include um, if we index into a particular cluster of rows, that will still give us a pseudo signature. If we take the transpose, we still get a pseudo signature. So just some kind of artificial thing that makes life a bit easier. So what do these match identities tell us? Well, let's consider a really basic example. Um, so what you're looking at here is some uh, subset, uh, some submatrix of the standard signature matrix, um, where the row indices are shown here, the column indices here. And let's assume that the parity of the number of external nodes is such that these entries happen to be zeros. And what the match gate identity corresponding to this really tells us is that the 2 by 2 matrix uh, indexed in green, shown on the left, is up to a sign equal to the 2 by 2 determinant uh, on the right. Um, and so in other words, in some sense, if we look at these two columns, 1100 and 1111, the 2 by 2 minors, if the 2 by 2 minors between these two columns all vanish, then the 2 by 2 minors between these two columns also all vanish. In particular, uh, the rows, sorry, I guess I said, yeah. Um, so the, the rows 1100 and 1111 are linearly dependent if sort of the intermediate rows 1101 and 1110 are linearly dependent. More generally, um, one can show that you know, if we have some rows, say, all zeros and all ones, then we look at all possible pairs where we swap out a 0 for a 1 on the left and a 1 for a 0 on, on the right. Um, and if all of these pairs are mutually linearly dependent, then the original rows are also linearly dependent. So this is really all we really need out of match gate identities. Um, and uh, as I'll explain, in some sense, it tells us that linear relations among wedges of rows of even parity yield linear relations among wedges of rows of odd parity. So what do I mean by wedge? Um, so given a vector space, uh, the sort of second exterior power of uh, that vector space is basically the vector space given by quotienting out the uh, tensor of its uh, vector space with itself by the skew symmetry relation. Um, and it has basis, which is sort of these wedge products of basis vectors of V. So explicitly, if we have some, some vector uh, from V, uh, and another vector from V, so V and W, then the wedge has coefficients in this new basis, which are basically just these 2 by 2 minors I was talking about. Um, in particular, you know, V and W are linearly dependent if and only if their wedge is 0. So going back to the original example, we have these rows 0, 0, 0, 0, zero and 1, 1, 1, 1. And if this wedge product vanishes, um, then it implies that the corresponding uh, linear combination of wedge products of the odd uh, rows also vanishes. Uh, let's consider another example. Say we have the following linear relation among these two wedges, so some random wedges. And now we consider sort of all of the possible pairs of intermediate rows. So, you know, all zeros and all ones gives rise to uh, all combinations of, you know, one, one, and three ones. Similarly, zero, zero, one, one, and one, one, zero, zero. Um, you sort of look at all ways that you can swap out 
um, a 1 with a 0 and a 0 with a 1. You get these four possible uh, combinations. Um, and basically, I'm saying that the match guy identities imply that if you have this linear relation among the even rows, then you have a linear relation among the odd rows. Right. So, um, so no need to remember the actual match guy identities anymore. Um, we sort of have this coordinate-free interpretation of uh, the match guy identities. And this turns out to be all that we really need. Um, so first, let me show why rank rigidity, why this, the fact that the rank is always a power of 2 implies that we always have a cluster. Um, all right, so say we have some pseudo-signature of size 2 to the L by 2 to the N and has rank uh, 2 to the big K. Right? It has rank equal to the domain size. Um, all right, and so we can, we can furthermore assume that this pseudo-signature has no proper clusters of rows which have the same rank as itself. Um, if that were the case, then we can sort of replace our pseudo-signature with the pseudo-signature indexed by those, that cluster of rows. We can replace this, uh, this L in the width by this, uh, this new L prime, which is the size of the um, number of positions that this cluster can vary on. And we'll just ignore everything outside of those positions. So, all right, so we can make this assumption that if you ever index into a proper cluster of rows, the rank goes down. Um, all right, so inductively, we know we have some cluster of 2 to the k minus 1 linearly independent rows. Um, so let's just say they look something like this. You have you know, all zeros. These are sort of the fixed uh, positions. And these are the positions in the cluster that are allowed to vary. And so if we knew that the fixed positions were only a single position, then we're basically done because in that case, you only have uh, 2 to the uh, k entries to work with. We know it's of rank 2 to the k, so the cluster is just the entire matrix itself. Right. So let's assume to the contrary that we have more than one position that is fixed. Right. And now let's say you know, we have in total 2 to the k, not just 2 to the k minus 1, but 2 to the k. Uh, linearly independent rows. Suppose one of the other ones, so we still have 2 to the k minus 1 linearly independent rows to account for. Suppose one of them were this, you know, something with a 0 among the fixed positions. Uh, well, if that were the case, now consider the cluster where this position is, all, is always equal to 0. Well, now we have a proper cluster where the rank is 2 to the k minus 1 plus 1. So by rank rigidity, if we look at, at that cluster, we actually already have 2 to the k linearly in, independent rows. Uh, so contradiction to our original assumption. So where do the 2 to the k minus 1 remaining linearly independent rows have to be? They have to be the ones where the fixed uh, bits are all equal to 1. Okay. And so now how does any other row in this matrix uh, fit into here? Well, it has to be in the span of the first cluster, because if you look at this position, um, if you look at the, the cluster where this, this bit is equal to 0, then it's going to give a proper sub subcluster um, with rank equal to the rank of the original matrix, which is a contradiction. It must also lie in the span of uh, this cluster for the same reason. If you look at this bit and look at the cluster corresponding to that bit being set to 1, you again sort of get this contradiction. So in particular, any other row has to lie in the span of these vectors as well as these vectors. In other words, it has to be 0. And so by the match key identities, we find that this vector and this vector are linearly dependent contradiction. So that's uh, why rank rigidity implies cluster existence. Um, and now, how, how do we show this rank rigidity? I probably only have time to work through the base case, uh, but hopefully this gives uh, an idea of how these match gate identities are used. Um, all right, so the thing I want to show is that you know, if I have a small pseudo-signature with rank at least 2 to the k plus 1, then in fact, its rank is going to be a power of 2. It's going to be 2 to the k plus 1 in the exponent. Um, okay, so how do we show this? Well, let's, let's do a toy example. So inductively, again, we have some cluster of 2 to the k. And we want to show, so I denote by you know, things that we know to be linearly independent, I denote in red. Um, and we, we, we know we have at least 2 to the k plus 1 linearly independent rows. So outside of this cluster, 
we also have some, let's say, some vector 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's the index. And I want to basically fill up this entire picture by showing that everything can be colored red, uh, that everything is linearly independent. And if that's the case, then, then we're done. Um, so let's, let's focus on this vector for now, uh, this, this index. So in this row, uh, I claim that this is also linearly independent of these red uh, rows. Um, and I'm going to use this sort of wedge product uh, idea. So suppose on the contrary that this, this, index, this row in this box lay in the span of the red rows. Well, now let's look at the wedge product of this with the, zero, the all zeros row. Um, and if it's in the span of the red rows, then you know, for some linear combination of these wedges, this equation will hold. But what, is the match gate identities, uh, what did the match gate identities tell us? They tell us that this wedge corresponds to the wedge of 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1. We sort of swap out this 1 for a 0, this 1 for a 0. Um, and so the left-hand side sort of corresponds to this. And the right-hand side corresponds. So if we take any sigma which is indexing a red even row, um, you see that you only ever have zeros um, in the first position. Um, so match gate identities sort of tell us that if this linear relation held, then there's some re linear relation among these wedge products of odd rows. If, if there are a linear relation among the even rows, uh, the wedges of even rows, then there is a linear relation among the wedges of the odd rows. Um, <coughs> but in particular, because these are linearly independent, these red rows, then this means, um, sorry, this should say rows. Uh, if, there's if there's a relation, if the red rows are linearly independent, then the wedges of them are going to be linearly independent. So we actually have a contradiction. And this 1, 0, 0, 1 must lie outside the span of the red rows. All right. So now we can mark that as red. And we can continue. Let's say, suppose the contrary, 1, 0, 1, 0 is in the span of the red rows. Um, now that means we also have a, we would have a linear relation as follows, where we're wedging with the all zeros row. And we play the same game. Right? So by match gate identities, this wedge gives rise to, this wedge of even rows gives rise to a wedge of odd rows. Um, and same here. And if we compare these, we see that there can't possibly exist a linear relation among all of these rows. And so 1, 0, 1, 0 also doesn't lie in the span of the red row. So we can also mark it as red. And so proceeding, I don't want to uh, bore you with the, the, the details, but uh, proceeding in this way, we can basically show that all of the rows can be marked as red. Right. So that's the base case of rank rigidity. Um, and let's see. So I'm not sure if I have time to go over the inductive step, but um, I guess I'll say a bit about why this floor function uh, arises. So what happens, we've only considered the case of domain sizes that are powers of 2. In all the other cases, um, a result of Fu and Yang, um, basically we can adapt to show that cases where the domain size isn't a power of 2 reduce the cases where it is a power of 2. Um, so they basically show that over domain, domain size 2, um, if you have a holographic algorithm which uses a basis that is of rank 2, and you already have a basis collapse theorem over domain size 2, then the same collapse theorem holds in the rank 2 case. You can more generally show that uh, if you have a collapse theorem over domain size r, and you have a basis matrix which is of rank r, then the collapse theorem over domain size r carries over into the rank r case. Um, and so in particular, uh, you know, by rank rigidity, the standard signature we already know has a power of 2 rank. In particular, by this relation, m must have a rank of power of 2 as well, the basis matrix. And so by this Fu and Yang result, we show basically that a collapse theorem over domain size 2 to the k implies one for a k which is not a power of 2. So in particular, we get this floor function. All right, so remaining questions, you know, what happens? We, this entire time, we've operated under the assumption that we have a, a match gate which is a full rank signature. Um, and the question is, uh, what happens if no such full rank signature exists? Um, and Ming Chi's paper deals with this uh, to, to some extent. Um, and also, the other question is, now that we have this collapse theorem, we can, you know, start asking questions about holographic algorithms over higher domains. And hopefully, now that we restricted the range of basis matrices that we have to consider, um, hopefully this uh, understanding of the structural theory of match gates for these higher domains um, can be more tractable. Um, 
right, so in conclusion, I'd like to thank Professor Valiant for um, advising me through this project, uh, Professor Tai for uh, copious uh, um, help with um, earlier drafts of the paper, um, and the graduate fellowship for supporting this research, and the Science Institute for inviting me. Thanks. We've heard in previous talks about the set of affine signatures, which are a case that's tractable for non-planar CSV. Do you think it would be possible to use similar linear algebraic techniques to show a collapse theorem for holographic algorithms based on affine signatures instead of based on? <coughs> um, I'm not terribly familiar with that area, but um, it, basically the the main point is that this leverages these you know these algebraic identities, uh, gets out some kind of linear algebraic. Uh, um, corollaries to those identities, and if, if you have corresponding ones for these affine signatures, then hopefully the same kind of idea will work. But it, all this sort of just boils down to some combo and some linear algebra, so <laughs> but hopefully that can make it. Yeah. So this may be very naive, but the un, what you call the unsurprising part of the hard part is is this kind of coming from like Shannon signal capacity because you have these kind of predictable things that are showing up. Is that is that the intuition? Um, for the floor function or or well, for the log the two? Floor function you said was surprising. Yeah, yeah. The log two of k you said was un. un oh, oh uh, something. Yeah. Uh, so I guess let me see if I can go back to that picture. So um, I guess earlier uh, when I was talking about this idea of so what did I mean by encoding colors by um, by you know bits corresponding to the basis size, um, I was basically saying, you know, in the in the previous setting, saying whether a wire was you know true or false um, corresponded to either omitting or including the uh, this external node in the corresponding match gate. Uh, and when you have a wider range of colors, um, you still want to s somehow say like each color corresponds to you know removing um, some collection of external nodes, um, and so. Intuitively, you want like every uh, every color to be uh, associated to some subset of those nodes, and so you get this two to the uh, two to the block size equals uh, like this, the range of colors that can that you can take on. So that, that's sort of where the encoding by bits comes from. So this is about uh, automated search for holographic algorithms. Sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, how feasible is this going to be? Um, to yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess the the utility of the collapse theorem for the original collapse theorem for domain size two was that uh, you you only really need to sort of stare at you know all possible two two by two matrices over so over some field and. Um, you can sort of explicitly write down like these equations that such signatures are satisfied. So, if you're willing to do the work for larger matrices, at least you sort of restrict the universe of basis matrices that you have to consider. But I guess as the domain size goes up, you know the dimensions of these the matrices also go up. But there are sort of some limit now to what you can consider. Yeah. And, and this, uh, so match gate's the only game in town. Uh, so, so there are no there are no match gates for larger domain sizes. Um, so, oh, so reducing, like reducing to the domain size two is the only game. So yeah. So uh, I think at this point, for, I guess maybe Professor Sire, Professor Valiant, feel the same way on this. But there, are, I guess there are like a few. Uh, there's a dimension one variety, a dimension zero variety of uh, like holographic algorithms um, over these higher domain sizes. Um, but I think overall, it's a very like poorly understood uh, area. So. Any, any further questions? No? Okay, let's thank the speaker.